I speak to you now in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Well, it's pretty obvious that we don't have any more of this going on. Um, somebody here ratted me out. Okay. I don't know who it was, but one of you did. Uh, but it was interesting the way you did it. Uh, apparently, you called the lady that cut my hair, and it was not you, Juanita, because you were not here last week. Uh, it's good to see you, by the way. Um, and, uh, and said, you just need to see him on the video they shot. He looks like one of the Osmonds. <laughs> Golly! I could have taken... A whole lot other criticism far better than that. So, here we go. Um, last week, uh, I posted a, uh, a video online of something called the Epiclesis of the Divine Liturgy, as performed by a Serbian bishop, or pardon me, a Romanian bishop, uh, Bishop Sebastian, in the Romanian Orthodox Church. Now this liturgy was taking place in Eastern Europe and it was in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, which meant that the priest is facing the altar. He is facing east, symbolically facing towards Jerusalem. And in front of him, uh, the, uh, the chalice, the patent are all uncovered, the bread and the wine, and he is in the middle of the liturgy. There are bells being run. There is incense wafting into the rafters of the building. And there's actually something called an iconostasis separating the bishop from the rest of the congregation. It's a, a wall of religious art, mostly icons but also paintings with just a single arched opening through which the people can see only the back of the bishop and just occasionally a glimpse of what is taking place here. He is chanting beautifully. Now, there was a bit of humor involved in posting this because it's something very Catholic also in tradition. And I made the comment about, you know, perhaps Mother Mia would like to do this someday at a liturgy here. But the fact is, if you were watching that video, or even if you're just listening to my description of it, you're also having uh, basically an interpretation of our Old Testament reading. An interpretation of our Old Testament reading. For hundreds of years at this point in our Old Testament story, the Israelites have not just wandered in the wilderness, but even in the established country, the promised land, they have moved the ark from place to place. At various times, it, it sits for a, a period in one particular place, but it's actually held and, and, and placed inside a large tent when it's not in the field. When it's in the field, it's, being, it's, it's leading the army against the foes of Israel. But now is the time of Solomon. And while his father David had talked about building a temple, a house for the Lord, Solomon actually accomplishes this. The temple has been built, the first temple, and the ark has been placed within the sanctuary. If you ever wonder where we get our words, the sanctuary is not this, by the way. These are transepts. This is a nave. This is the sanctuary. In the ancient temple, it's where the ark of the covenant was placed. The ark of the covenant actually sat upon the stone that tradition says that Abraham had offered up Isaac. It sits upon that stone, or it sat upon that stone. That stone, by the way, is still there. It's now underneath the Dome of the Rock. 
But in any case, that's what the Old Testament story is about this morning. The ark for the first time being placed with inside the sanctuary. And there is a cloud that descends and fills the sanctuary. Nothing less than what we would use incense for to convey the, the presence of God and the holiness of that moment. And Solomon is standing before the ark with arms outstretched, intoning the promises that he is making on behalf of Israel to God. And that is exactly what the dear bishop is doing in that video. And that is, in fact, what Mia and I are doing every single time we gather around this table. The epiclesis, as it's called in that video, is actually the moment when the Holy Spirit is invoked. So the Holy Spirit's transformative power to make bread and wine into body and blood, to change what is offered here into something holy and divine. We don't stand with our backs to you. The early murals, the early mosaics of the church show that after Jesus establishes the Eucharist, the table, instead of being an altar of sacrifice, becomes an altar of thanksgiving. And the celebrant, the priest, stands behind it to call the people together around the body and blood of Christ. This is all, this is all sort of a Eucharistic theology that's being proclaimed. We're talking about what happens here. And I can do that for an hour, maybe two. Anybody up for that this morning? <laughs> let, let me just say thank you, Mia. <laughs> thank you. I had a, uh, a parent one time whose uh, who small child, who had been baptized, when we would come and, and bring the Eucharist, bring the wafer to start with, the child would always put their hands up like this. And the parent would always reach over and push their hands down and say, just a blessing. This happened a couple of times. And so after the service one Sunday, I said, Tell me why you're doing that. And they said, because the child doesn't really understand what's happening. I said, oh, okay. So you do. Explain it to me. <laughs> and, and I was ready to sit for an hour, maybe two. And they, they were like, well, well you know, it's, it's Jesus. I said, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's Jesus. And it's both that simple and that complex at the same time. What happens here is Solomon standing before the ark of God. What happens here is the Orthodox bishop in Eastern Europe standing before the altar of the Lord. What happens here is Jesus talking about his body and His blood. And we understand it, despite my honest ability to talk about it for hours, we understand it about as well as the disciples did. In other words, we don't. It's one of those things that we accept. But I can say, without any doubt that it changes us. That it is something more than bread and wine. That the Holy Spirit does indeed transform it, and when we partake, it transforms us. We become a part of something far greater and far more powerful. A number of years ago, actually, 
the fall of 1995, I was a, a young deacon in the church. And we were going around and touring the various institutions owned or operated by the diocese, the different camps. And, and we went actually to Camp St. Christopher down the lower diocese. We went to Camp Gravit. We went to Canuga. We visited Voorhees, a uh, historically black uh, university that is wholly supported by and owned by the Episcopal Church. And we visited Still Hopes, the retirement community in Columbia. And while at Still Hopes, we went to a Alzheimer's unit, a memory care unit, we would call it now. And Hop Weston, an elderly priest, was celebrating the Eucharist for folks in the Alzheimer's unit. And he stood there and he used the old words. He celebrated as they would have heard it proclaimed in their youth. And he went through the liturgy. And he came to the Lord's Prayer. And he began to say it. And people who on other days did not speak at all began to recite the Lord's Prayer. Perfectly. There was a feeling. An extraordinary feeling in the room. And then he began to distribute the bread and wine, the body and blood of Jesus. And every single person held their hands up to receive. And when he would place the wafer in their hand, every single person said, Amen. Amen. That was the tradition of their youth. Now, doctors, neurologists will tell you that there is something about the human brain that even in the midst of something as debilitating as that profound dementia, there are certain things that call people back into the moment. And I saw this with my own mother. Music being one. Liturgy being another. Something that they have participated in. Something that calls something out of them. John McCain. John McCain said, there is something liberating about giving yourself to a cause that is larger than yourself. Something that encompasses you, but that is not dependent on you for its understanding. In other words, something that surrounds you, envelops you, overwhelms you, and changes you. You don't change it. It changes you. It changes you. I don't understand what happens here. Despite Thousands of times now of invoking the Holy Spirit at the Epiclesis. I do not understand this. But I can participate in it. Solomon says that this will be the house of God and God will be their God. But he has a bit of a, a proviso in there as well. And it's not for God. It's for God's people. If you will do the will of God. In other words, if you will step into that role to be what that transformative moment is calling you to be. For us, a follower of Christ. Someone who enters this place one way and exits another. Someone who accepts what this place is and who we are called to be and is changed because of it. And if you're like me, you probably need to come next week to get changed again.
because if you're lucky, halfway through the week, you're going to fall short. If you're like me, some days in the afternoon after you leave here, you're going to fall short. We come back to be fed and refed and nourished and nurtured and grow as a people called to be followers of Christ. Jesus asked the disciples after his very hard teaching, well, do y'all want to leave too? And they say, where would we go? Where would you go? Where would I go? This is not just a church home. It is a fueling station. One to fill us. One to overwhelm us. One to make us more than we could possibly be in any other way or place. All for the purpose of going out into the world. Amen.